My name is Julia Brooks, and I work at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative on the ATA program, which is the Advanced Training Program on Humanitarian Action. And in the ATA program, we work with humanitarian practitioners and organizations to address key challenges and dilemmas in the field, including legal, policy, and operational challenges. And in particular, I work on international humanitarian law and policy. One of the urgent challenges facing the humanitarian sector today that we've been looking at is the instance of violence against humanitarians. There's a number of reasons why uh, attacks against aid workers seem to be increasing in recent years. Some of them are contextual, related to the conflicts in which uh, humanitarians are operating, and some of them relate to humanitarian actors themselves. So with regard to the contextual factors, we see that overall, uh, today the majority of conflicts are in non-international armed conflicts, or internal conflicts, within states that feature non-state armed groups, uh, insurgents, or militia groups, and often fighting within heavily populated areas, and often with uh, high levels of disrespect for international humanitarian law, which aims to protect civilians and humanitarian workers in conflict. So these types of conflicts are having a heavy toll on civilians and aid workers alike, and that's important to keep in mind. When we talk about violence against humanitarians, this violence is also affecting civilian populations, uh, often to a, a much greater extent. There are also a number of factors related to humanitarian action itself, which seems to be driving some of the increase in attacks. One has been, we've seen the politicization of aid work in a number of conflicts, which is driving increased hostility and, and incentives to attack aid workers. In some cases, aid workers have been attacked directly by virtue of uh, their operations, which are perceived as aiding the enemy or contributing to the other side uh, in a conflict. In other cases, they've been targeted indirectly by virtue of their perceived association with, for instance, uh, government forces, military forces of that state, or international militaries, which are seen as invaders or enemy forces. And so targeting humanitarians is a way to oppose those, those outside forces. This is really a, in contrast to the humanitarian principle of, principles of neutrality, impartiality, and, and independence, which are meant to, to take humanitarians and, and more broadly civilians outside of the conflict. Civilians, and including aid workers, are not to be targeted under international humanitarian law, which distinguishes between civilians and, and combatants, with the aim of protecting civilians and reducing human suffering in conflict. So we see that the erosion of the perception of aid workers as neutral and impartial and somehow outside of the conflict is contributing to targeting against them. There's also a number of uh, economic or financial factors, which in a way have always existed, but contribute to violence against aid workers who are often better resourced or wealthier than the local population or have trucks, equipment, electronics, computers, or valuable relief supplies, which could be the target of raids or um, kidnapping for ransom, for instance, is, is one of the highest uh, types of, of violence that we're seeing. So these are some of the factors which are contributing to the increase in violence against humanitarians. But overall, it's also important to note that a lot of the factors in particular cases are not well understood. There's often a combination of these different factors, and it's hard in many individual cases to really know what are the true motivations of the perpetrators of these attacks and how we would respond to addressing those motivations or uh, creating disincentives to attacking aid workers. So this is an area where there's a lot more need for research and engagement with armed groups and militaries to understand the true motives and incentives driving some of this violence. There have been a number of very useful efforts which have under, which have gone on over the last few years and going back even a decade or so, looking in particular at uh, quantifying and tracking incidents of violence. We have a number of databases which have emerged. A great one is the Aid Worker Security Database, which is publicly available online. We also have Insight and Security, organizations like Humanitarian Outcomes, which are collecting and, and producing data and also reports so we can really track across countries and contexts what types of violence is occurring. And this has allowed us to see this sharp increase in recent years in the number of attacks. But there's still a great need for better research, also more disaggregated data. It's hard to tell given the, the current statistics. And also many organizations themselves keep their own internal data that's not necessarily shared publicly on, on instances affecting them. But it's hard to tell given the current data what types of aid workers are most affected or most vulnerable to violence, what types of projects and operations, the effect of gender, so the different risks or vulnerabilities or resiliencies of ma male versus female aid workers. Also, the, the balance between national staff and international staff. Often, uh, violence against international staff is what captures the headlines, 
but we see that uh, about 90% of victims of violence against aid workers are in fact national and local staff, and national and local staff make up the vast majority of aid workers overall, so it, it makes sense that they would also be most affected by, by this violence. But we do need much more research, I think, into understanding some of these disaggregated effects in order to target better responses. So on the question of who's attacking aid workers or who's perpetrating these attacks, I think that there's a common misperception that these attacks are emanating from non-state armed groups, from insurgents, militias, and many in fact are. But we also see attacks coming from state militaries, uh, from regular armed groups, for instance, the US airstrike on a MSF hospital in Kunduz in late 2015. We've seen in Syria a deliberate campaign, a systematic campaign of targeting hospitals, medical workers and other humanitarians by the Syrian armed forces as well as Russian armed forces, uh, for instance, in an attack uh, airstrike on a Red Cross convoy last year. So the attacks are really coming from both non-state actors and uh, state actors from parties to conflicts in, in a variety of different settings. So that's another area that uh, I think requires a lot more research and engagement and figuring out how to address the the different causes of violence among these different types of actors. There, there's a big difference, for instance, between deliberate and systematic targeting of aid organizations by some groups as part of their strat strategy of war, which is very clearly prohibited by international law and yet we see occurring in a number of contexts, most notably in Syria. And on the other hand, uh, incidents of indiscriminate attacks on aid workers and civilians alike, or cases of accidental or, or cases of um, false targeting, mistaken targeting, which are affecting aid workers uh, as well. So those will each require different responses to address. The in significant increase in violence against aid workers is having a pretty significant and negative effect on aid delivery and humanitarian assistance in the field. There's some great research recently by the SAVE study that's securing access in vulnerable environments, which found that in some of the most highly insecure contexts, the fewest aid organizations, the fewest humanitarians are able to respond, and that often humanitarian organizations cluster into more stable and secure environments, leaving those populations in more stable environments to be overserved by aid, and those populations in more insecure environments to be underserved. And those are often the populations that are being currently underserved that are perhaps in the greatest need. So this is really posing a challenge to uh, upholding the humanitarian principle of impartiality which is the idea that aid be given to those in the most urgent need with no discrimination based on other factors. But if humanitarians aren't able to operate in these highly insecure areas, decisions on the allocation of aid are being made often uh, with regard to security and not just need alone. Another effect that we see these attacks having has been a move toward remote management, relying on local partners. Very few organizations are able to operate consistently and effectively in uh, these environments, in particular ICRC and MSF, but many others are not able to. And notably, these organizations that are operating have also taken some of the highest uh, casualties by virtue of their continued operations. The movement by many to distance themselves from these areas where it's, where it's most difficult to operate is raising a number of concerns with regard to the, the quality of aid that's reaching these areas, and also whether the burden is shifting to local actors. So as international organizations take a step back, withdraw from some of these harder to, to operate in areas, increasingly it's local and national aid workers that are filling these gaps and maybe as a result even more exposed to insecurity, but with less resources, less institutional support, often less training and, and other assets to, to keep themselves safe. So this is a real concern that the burden may just be shifting to local and national actors um, by virtue of the, the withdrawal of, of internationals. So we've seen a real growth in the professionalization of security risk management, much more uh, in-depth thinking about contextual analysis, risk assessments, and how to continue operating effectively in these high-risk environments despite the risks. We've also seen more attention being paid in the sector to duty of care concerns, so organizations thinking through their responsibilities to their own staff and partners. And uh, despite the, the general risks of humanitarian action, which have always existed, how to be responsible employers and, and sponsors in these contexts. But we see a number of challenges which are remaining uh, in the sector. With regard to the collection of data and quantification of these trends, there's still 
a lot of need for more uh, fine-grained knowledge about where these attacks are occurring and who they're affecting. We often see country-level statistics, but within countries there could also be great variations in insecurity also over time. And so there's a need for more information on that. We also see that while some information sharing is occurring, especially between organizations operating in the same environment that may need and share resources on security management, especially among smaller organizations, there, especially in highly insecure environments, there can be a reluctance to share sensitive information or a distrust of, of other organizations and how this information may be used. So that's one of the things that is often hindering the, the level of information sharing and um, understanding of data on, on these incidents. There's an important point to be made that traditionally, and even to today, the mission of humanitarians is to bring humanitarian aid and assistance to populations in need. That means that these beneficiary populations are at the forefront of what they do and the center of their advocacy as well. So traditionally, humanitarian organizations have been reluctant to advocate for their own protection, for their own operations and staff, and instead to focus solely on the protection of beneficiaries. With the, the increase in incidents of violence in recent years, we've seen more and more organizations coming out, engaging in public advocacy or confidential engagement with states and parties around their ability to operate and the protection of their staff. But this is still a, an area of tension and, and unease. Well, we see a sort of taboo uh, about discussing humanitarians' own protection as opposed to the protection of their beneficiaries. And what many would say is that this is not a, a either or or a contrast, but rather protecting humanitarians is essential in order to protect civilians, in order to bring aid and assistance to civilians. So populations in need still remain at the forefront of humanitarian action, of humanitarian advocacy and operations and, and thinking, but that in order to enable this humanitarian uh, action to continue, especially in the areas where it's most urgently needed, it's essential that humanitarian aid workers, whether international or national, be able to operate with uh, at least some minimal level of, of security. As we've seen over recent years, there's been a great increase in the number of organizations that are collecting data on incidents of violence that are marking where these attacks are occurring and when, and that's enabled us to really see over the years where the, the trend lines are occurring and to focus on what are some of the most insecure environments for aid workers. That said, there's also a lot of um, gaps in the available data, and there's a lot of dispute about what these statistics are telling us. In particular, the years that we've seen a, an increase in recorded attacks against humanitarians have also been years when the humanitarian sector has grown a lot as a whole. So there's a question of, given the increased number of humanitarian actors in the field and the increased context and, and nature and scope of the work that they're doing, how does the, the rate of attacks, uh, is it changing or, or can we tell based on, on the numbers now? So there's a need for more work on, on quantification in that regard. Also, many organizations now are collecting internal data but, and, and in many cases sharing it with others, with other organizations and, and researchers, but especially in some of the most insecure environments, there's al also often a reluctance to share sensitive information about programs and security incidents. So that's one thing which has been getting in the way of a, a broader understanding uh, across organizations in the sector about how, when, and where these uh, attacks are in fact occurring. Another thing that I would say on some of the causes, and motives, or drivers of these attacks is that while we know generally some of the factors driving violence against aid workers, we don't understand these nearly well enough in order to respond effectively. So we know that the context for humanitarian operations are changing and this is affecting civilians and aid workers alike. We're operating more and more in internal conflicts where uh, war is playing out among civilian populations. and This is taking a heavy toll on civilians and aid workers alike. We see also a, a disturbing trend of growing disrespect for the norms of international humanitarian law in conflicts in a number of settings which these rules were designed to protect civilians, including aid workers, but civilian populations as a whole from uh, the suffering caused in conflict. And the growing disrespect for these norms is, is very concerning uh, in, in many ways, not just with regard to violence against aid workers themselves. And in addition to those contextual factors, we see also political, financial, and other motivations for violence against aid workers. With regard to uh, political motivations, we've seen in, an, in a number of recent conflicts the politicization of humanitarian action. This was particularly stark in 
Iraq and Afghanistan, for instance, aid workers were increasingly seen as allied or associated with Western forces, with invading militaries, enemy political parties or, or armed groups, and therefore were, were targeted by association. We also see targeting of aid workers out of political aims, out of the desire to cut off aid to enemy populations. We see attacks against aid workers, which are, are directed at undermining this notion that neutral, impartial, independent aid is outside the conflict and therefore to be protected. But more and more humanitarian action is seen as part of the environment of conflict and a legitimate target, which is clearly prohibited by international law, but it's a trend that is occurring overall. We also see financial or economic incentives for the targeting of aid workers, often by virtue of the fact that they're wealthier, better resourced, or equipped than the local populations. So this may be kidnapping for ransom, which is a, a very prevalent type of, of violence. We also see uh, theft of vehicles, uh, raids on compounds to steal electronics, computers, uh, attacks on aid convoys or warehouses for relief materials, which humanitarians control. So there may be incentives by armed groups to either gain money or resources by attacking uh, humanitarians. And that's not necessarily anything new, but is occurring at, at significant uh, and concerning rates. Overall, though, in, in many particular instances, it's very difficult to distinguish between a variety of these drivers, which, is con which are contributing to the particular attack. So, we don't understand nearly well enough what are the particular incentives of perpetrators in many of these cases, and what would be some of the disincentives or um, motives to protect aid workers or at least not be uh, hostile towards them, and how those incentives could be um, leveraged by the humanitarian community, by states and other actors to create a more protective environment for, for humanitarian action. There's a traditional notion that the humanitarian principles defend or protect aid workers, that by operating in a neutral, impartial, and independent manner, humanitarians should be outside the conflict and therefore not uh, targetable or not seen as the object of uh, military attack. Now, what we see today is, is the question arising of whether violence against aid workers is a symptom of an erosion of these principles, whether there's been a, uh, an erosion of neutrality, impartiality, and independence on behalf of aid workers, or whether these principles, in fact, do not uh, automatically operate to shield humanitarians from violence, but may, in fact, provoke it. For instance, in the case of the principles of neutrality and impartiality, the idea is that humanitarians serve both sides in a conflict. They're not partial to a particular population, but operate irrespective of, of who set it on to fill humanitarian needs. Now, in many cases, this can provoke hostility when providing aid to the population on the other side or to an area controlled by an enemy armed force. We see that this is contributing to attacks by some armed groups which seek to cut off aid to uh, opposing populations. So being neutral and being impartial in itself may be, in fact, driving some of the violence against humanitarian actors. In other cases, with the growth and expansion of humanitarian actors in the field, it may be that the different interpretations of these principles or undisciplined action is, is contributing to uh, a loss of their actual or perceived neutrality and independence, for instance, by uh, associating with armed forces or political agendas. That's also contributing to the erosion of respect for and the, the protection of, of humanitarian actors. As more and more organizations are coming out, speaking publicly, calling for renewed respect for humanitarian law and condemning these attacks against aid workers, there's still this tension between speaking out and what are the benefits of speaking out, what can organizations hope to accomplish by publicly condemning these attacks, and what are some of the potential risks to operations and staff remaining in country or local partners and others or even uh, beneficiary populations of speaking out. Will speaking out or pursuing legal action alienate the parties that humanitarians depend upon for access and operations and make it even harder to operate? Or uh, will speaking out as part of broader efforts to pursue justice contribute to reversing this trend of violence against humanitarian action and creating a more protective environment for the pursuit of humanitarian assistance and protection to those in need. Attention has arisen between 
a sort of silence which is seen as, as protecting affected staff by not uh, highlighting them in public or speaking out on their behalf and not uh, producing more hostility or potential backlash from speaking out. But overall, this producing a sort of um, collective acceptance of these attacks becoming the new normal. So some are pushing for much more public advocacy on behalf of the protection of humanitarians uh, and to s bring about policy changes and, and other things to, to address this problem. Speaking out or engaging in advocacy on behalf of the protection of humanitarian actors is something that we're seeing more and more by humanitarian organizations, but it's also important that we look at the responsibility of states and other parties, uh, other parties and, uh, and conflict actors. There's a lot that humanitarians can do to change the way that they operate in the field, to more effectively uh, analyze the risks in particular contexts, to train and prepare their staff to operate in these highly insecure areas. But ultimately, it's the responsibility of states and other parties to conflict to enforce and implement the rules of humanitarian law that protect aid workers and civilians to bring perpetrators to account and to take other measures, policy changes, international uh, advocacy, legal action, which will reverse this dangerous trend of violence against humanitarians. So it's important to keep in mind that it's not all, the onus should not be all on the humanitarian community, but rather on the parties that are responsible for addressing this violence and as well as many of its root causes and conflict and, and political causes as well. This trend of violence against humanitarian workers has given rise to a lot of big questions facing the humanitarian sector, uh, which will continue for, for a while to come, I think. One is uh, the extent to which humanitarian operations as they've been occurring, as they've been carried out thus far, are possible in some of these most highly insecure environments. Very few organizations have shown an, an ability to operate effectively in these environments. And so if we see that less and less aid is reaching those populations or areas that are often in the most need, this really forces us to rethink how we're implementing the humanitarian principles in practice and how humanitarian operations are, are, should be designed or configured in the future. This is posing big challenges to the traditional notions of neutrality and impartiality and independence with regard to the ways that humanitarians operate, how they associate with political actors, with UN or international bodies which have both political and development and humanitarian agendas, how and, and when humanitarians may associate with military forces that are increasingly providing aid, in, especially in natural disasters, but also in complex emergencies as well. Another big question that uh, violence against aid workers poses to the humanitarian community is with regard to the balance between international organizations and staff and local staff. National and local aid workers already do the vast majority of humanitarian action. Over 90% of the sector is made up by national and local staff, and they're also the most affected by violence. And there's been a movement toward localization even more, partially in response to insecurity, but also in response to the sense that local communities should be taking more ownership. Local communities already uh, are the most affected and engaged and, and most capable of responding to their unique challenges and needs. So, one challenge is this big push toward localization at the same time as international organizations are still in many ways calling the shots with regard to international funding of humanitarian efforts, the design of humanitarian coordination schemes and types of responses. So this tension or shift between international and local and national uh, actors is going to be a big one, especially with regard to uh, insecurity and, and violence against humanitarians. Humanitarians have been able to operate for generations under these fundamental principles of humanity, neutrality, impartiality, and independence. And with the growing uh, erosion of many of these principles in the field or the challenges posed by disrespect for international humanitarian norms meant to protect civilians and, and aid workers alike, it's really forcing us to rethink the way that humanitarians can continue to operate in some of these most uh, insecure environments and what humanitarian action will need to look like in the future to respond to these threats and, and shifting norms.